Hi, um, I'm Alice and this is You Must Appear, Don't Panic, Why Words Matters. Or to fix that, my clicker's already gone. What have you done, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> it is called absolutely... Call the police on him. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna fix my own slide. You missed a period. Don't panic. Why words matter? And... I also, this is just a disclaimer, I don't do design. These are probably going to be the most boring slides that you've ever seen in your life. There is no, no There are no fancy colours, there are no cool graphics. This is just funny. Um, so, just a little intro to me. Um, so, I did undergrad degree in English language at University of Glasgow, and then I didn't know what on earth I wanted to do, so I just decided to keep going, and I did a PhD, which was... A massive mistake, and it took up overall. I think I've spent a decade of my life in university, but I learned some really cool stuff. Um, I then went from that, and I, I went into publishing. Um, I spent five years in education publishing, um, and what I was doing on a day to day basis, um, I was really working with different stakeholders, um, teachers, education boards, students, sales team, scientists to make educational materials that really worked for everyone involved in the product. Um, my job was basically listening to all the different pieces of the puzzle that people wanted to fit in and somehow making that work. Um, and then last year I came to SteelCon um, when I was still working in publishing. And I'd been to InfoSec conferences before. I'd been to b Sides Newcastle. I'd been to Literature Hack. But SteelCon for me was a massive eye-opener into what the community is and what was really possible. Um, I spent a, a very large majority of my time at the Cybris stand playing the arcade machine. Um, last year it was Pac-Man. I did not win the Lego Millennium Falcon. Um, this year, uh, I'm going to beat myself up about this afterwards because I currently have the high score um, as of 10 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> the game this year is Space Invaders. Um, so yeah, and there is another Lego Millennium Falcon up for grabs. Um, but I, I really loved that, and I afterwards I wrote a blog post um, about basically being a non-InfoSec person at InfoSec conferences. Um, and then it came, well, it came as no surprise to uh, my other half that uh, about three months after SteelCon, I quit my job in publishing and I moved into InfoSec. Um, so I currently work at ID Cyber. Um, I do cyber essentials assessments, and I'm also a technical editor for them. If you don't know what Cyber Essentials are, it's basically like a cyber MOT. So I essentially work in Cyber Quick Fit. Um, <laughs> but it's fine because it's given me a really, really good introduction into tech in general. I'm learning about so much all the time. Um, and I'm actually really enjoying it. Um, and then as well, um, I'm currently also a technical writing fellow with Bellingcat. Um, that started a couple of months ago. So I'm working on my own project with them. Um, writing about something that's quite technical, but I'm writing it for a largely non-technical audience. Um, so these look like quite disparate um, aspects, uh, quite disparate careers, but they have one thing in common. It's all about words and it's all about puzzles. And that's what drives all of you. It's about, even if you don't know it, it's puzzles. You like seeing a problem and figuring out what is wrong and how to fix it. That is what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. That is what I was doing when I was working in publishing. I was putting puzzle pieces together, and that's what I'm doing now as well. And it's also all about words. Um, it's about communication, because everything you do, everything you know, you somehow have to communicate to someone. Um, and why give this talk? I mean, it's not. I'm not going to lie, it's not going to be a technical talk. Um, you were all far more technical than me at this point. Um, but I just wanted to share a bit about what I've kind of seen about language and communication in the industry so far and just kind of share some kind of insights and kind of tips for what you might be able to apply um, in your own work. Whenever I mention uh, English language, everyone's always like, oh yeah, spelling and grammar, you're going to care about apostrophes. And I'm not going to lie, I really do. This, like, <laughs> this riles me, something rotten. This is very close to um, my flat um, up in Glasgow. Um, no one knows whether this has an apostrophe or not. No one knows. Wikipedia doesn't know. Glasgow City Council doesn't know. These are both signs made by Glasgow City Council and they can't decide if there's an apostrophe or not. Um, 
And then even if you look at the city council's own website, you've just got apostrophe, no apostrophe, 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 no apostrophe, and an inexplicable queen park. (laughs) (laughs) So this absolutely riles me. Um, I I can't actually describe how angry it makes me. Um, But this is not what this talk is about. This talk is about things a little more along these lines. It's about spotting alternative meanings and identifying what's both being said and unsaid. Um, The kind of critical thing here is that just because we're all talking English, it doesn't mean we're talking the same language. So, example from Cyber Essentials. You need to consider what you're saying. Um, So this is a... (laughs) You didn't see that. (laughs) Um, This is a question from the Cyber Essentials questionnaire. Where you have a business need to use unsupported software, have you moved the devices and software out of scope of this assessment? And then you answer, that is not the case for our business. What are you telling me? Are you telling me that you don't have a business need to use unsupported software? Or are you telling me that you have not moved those devices and software out of scope? It's a really, really simple example, but that immediately, that's going to cause you a headache because we're going to come back to you and go, can you rewrite your answer? We don't understand what you're trying to tell us. And even if I have a really good guess at what you're trying to uh, tell me, it's not good enough for me to push it through from a compliance point of view. Next slide you've already seen. Mm-hmm. Um, does anyone know what this is? That's not. <laughs> so this this is an ugnot. Um, <laughs> I like how you're getting heckled, heckled at my talk. <laughs> um, so this this is an ugnot. Um, this is from the show The Mandalorian, um, and I immediately, as soon as I saw this episode, I was immediately taking notes, going, "This is perfect." Um, so the Ugnaught is a kind of critical group of creatures um, in the Mandalorian. Um, the main characters really need their um, support and advice in a particular section. Um, and one of the characters just goes up, approaches the Ugnaughts, and just is like, Hi, I want all these things. I am myself, I am a person of authority. Give us all the things. Um, and gets completely ignored. They don't even register that that person's in the room. So then someone else goes up. And basically says exactly the same thing, but closes us off, closes it off with the phrase, I have spoken. Um, which it's all about knowing your audience, because to an ugnaught, if you say that phrase, that immediately commands attention and respect. It's about knowing who you're talking to and about what they actually want um, from your conversation, which then applies to everything that we do on a day-to-day basis. You need to know how to communicate with your audience. What do they need or want to know? So if, you've, if you're trying to propose something to a CEO, you, you kind of know that they have a probably keen interest in what are the financial implications of this? What are the risks? Why should we do this? Why should I put all this, um, direct all this, all this resource into something that's going to cost me money? What is in it for me and my business? Sales as well. Sales teams want to know what are the sellable features in this thing that you're trying to push through. You need to know what is important to someone what, if, you try, if you want to communicate with them effectively. So this is a true story. For the purposes of this, I am seven years old and you are all my father. Um, <laughs> surprise. It is 6am and you are fast asleep. Dad? Mm hmm. Are you awake? Mm hmm. Sorry, I know it's early. I just woke up early and I wanted breakfast. So I thought I'd make toast. There's not actually enough milk for cereal. And I put the bread in the toaster. And I press the same button that mum does. And I'm really sorry. I don't actually know what I did. But the toaster kind of went a bit weird. (laughs) And the flames started coming out of it. (laughs) And the fire is going all up the wall and I can't stop it. (laughs) This is true. Uh, my dad still brings it up to this day. Um, 
how else could this conversation have gone? <laughs> Any suggestions? What would have been a more effective way to communicate to my dad? Fire. (laughs) Yeah, that's pretty much what I kind of proposed. Fire in the kitchen. That contains everything that my dad really needed to know in that moment. So now, how does that that relate to IR? Does anyone work in IR? (laughs) (laughs) What, Mark, what do you want when someone phones you? We are after it. Nice and quickly. Yeah, as quickly as possible. So, like, if they start telling you a big story, you're just going to get annoyed. Especially when they start phoning you in the middle of the night. So, I haven't worked in IR, um, but I live with someone who, for quite a long time, was not in IR, but was on call, was a senior on call, and would often get phone calls in the middle of the night. And the number of times that I would get woken up by a phone call and just hearing, no, what has happened? Tell me, no, I don't need a story. And it would just, there would be a very, very long conversation that had just so much unnecessary information that was just not needed at that point. You need the facts up front. And actually, something that I really, really love um, is this, which... um, (laughs) 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 So Jer um, started using this, um, and it's kind of caught on as a perfect example. This, This is a really great way to start a phone call if you're calling a senior on call. Um, because even if you then follow up with the information they actually need to know to come on and deal with whatever's happening, with those four words, they immediately know they are going to have to be up for a while and therefore it's a serious incident. You've oh, literally... They're all not tickets. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, yeah, they changed the automation to put it on. <laughs> yeah, because it's, and it's perfect. It's in four words, you have told them everything they need to know about the severity of that incident. The rest of the information can follow on later. It's absolutely perfect. Um, so it's all it's all about knowing your stakeholders and what they need to get out of the conversation. Um, and I spotted this on LinkedIn the other day, and I thought this was just another really great example because um, it's not just IR. So this is um, so Will Bushido Token made this meme, and it's about CTI analysts, and it's about no like people tend to write reports for themselves and for their colleagues, but actually they're not going to be the people reading this report. You're trying to write a report for a stakeholder. Who are the stakeholders if you write a report? You need to consider who your audience is. Um, which actually brings up another great point. Um, this was a slide I really loved from B-Sides Leeds, which was Holly Grace Williams um, at Akimbo Corps. I <laughs> 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 love this slide so much. Um, and I thought this was perfect, because this is an excerpt from um, a pen test report. Um, and Literally, the, the, that last phrase there, testing demonstrated it was likely misconfigured. The person getting that report knows that there is something that they have to fix. They know how someone broke in. They don't know that it was Jamie from accounts that did it. They don't care. That can come later. It's the what, the why comes later. Get the important stuff up front. Know your audience. Um, which comes me to a, to a little bit of a, of a ranty moment. Um, Actually know your audience. Don't assume. And um, this is obviously <laughs> this is obviously not always possible, but just a couple of things that have riled me fairly recently. Do not dear sir your way into an inbox or a ticketing system because you are not gonna get a nice response. You are going to get the harshest marking that you could possibly expect. <laughs> um and then this post here, um so proud of this little lady who graduated from the Empowering Women program today. <laughs> Hashtag women in cyber. <laughs> so I'm giving this the benefit of the doubt and thinking it might be an in-joke, but it's still not great because you've got people reading that who don't know the in-joke and you're immediately setting them aside and going, I don't really respect you. And that's just not a great message to be putting across. Um, other things to think about, US versus UK English. Um, this came up a lot in my last job, um, which was for it was for an American audience that we were writing the product for. And you really, really had to be aware of the words and the grammar that that audience used. They would interpret things completely differently, which actually is why I made the title of my slide, uh, the title of my talk, what what I did. You missed a period, which has a completely different meaning here than it does in the US. You and obviously context can play a part, but you really have to have an awareness of who it is that you are writing for. Um, another example from, from previous, from previous life is we were writing a lesson, um, where four year olds were being asked about a time that they had recently been to the beach. 
which sounds great. But this is for an American audience for um, kind of a very kind of um, impoverished area in the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> they are thousands of miles from any beach. And I can pretty much guarantee you that the percentage of children in that class who had ever been to a beach was pretty much zero. So we had to go and rewrite that entire section going, no, who is this class we are actually writing this material for? How do we introduce them to a concept of a beach? They've probably only seen it on TV. Um, and also about assuming, I spoke earlier about the, the Ugnaught CEO situation, but not every CEO is actually fixated on money. Some are very concerned primarily with, with their business in terms of the personnel within it, the culture. A lot of people, a lot of CEOs have a very kind of good focus on that. So even with my whole, eh, think about money for a CEO, think about the other things as well. Know who it is you're talking to. Which, this is another slightly ranty slide. Um, I, I didn't originally call this acronym hell, but I'm really pedantic about this. Not every, they're, they're also initialisms. It, it, it's, it's a kind of pedantic thing. So this is acronym or initialism hell. Um, not everyone knows what all of these are. Even I, I don't know what all of these are, and I put the slide together. And you immediately lose your audience if you start using uh, terms, acronyms, initialisms that they don't know. If you are dropping these into a meeting with someone from another team, and they don't know what these are, the first thing they're going to do is go off Googling, or they're going to completely dissociate and try and figure it out what it is that you're talking about. You don't want that to happen. You want them to be actually focused on you. Um, so if it's appropriate, split them out. Actually say what it is that the term is. And of course, context, context matters. I mean, CA can be certainly cyber assurance. It can be California, control area, cost analysis, configuration audit. Context obviously will help sometimes, but you still can't assume that your audience is going to have the same impressions uh, of what a term means that you do. Um, which... It's another really nice story um, that Kirsten here told me um, about the term PT, um, where, so Kirsten is a teacher, and uh, one of the other teachers at her school, um, a message went round saying this, this teacher's leaving the school, they've, um, they've, they're going off to be a PT. Does anyone know what a PT is? Are you a <laughs> so it's actually a principal teacher um, but a lot of the people actually assumed it was a personal trainer um, and they were very confused at this very abrupt career change physiotherapist is another one that I didn't even think of Yeah. <laughs> so you can see even there just that very very quickly terms, even, even within a school context people are not always going to know that PT means principal teacher um, this I really like this because it's just a really cute story. Um, but it's a time that I misjudged a conversation with a five-year-old. Um, so changing um, the battery on a car key. Um, car key broken, battery needed changing. That was fine. Small child approaches. What are you doing? I'm changing the battery. And there's just a pause. And then you just hear, what to? <laughs> and I had never even considered that as a possible response. I had just automatically assumed, like, I'm using the word change. I really mean replace, but everyone knows what I'm talking about. The five-year-old didn't. Come. It's just know your audience. Um, and now, so I'm going to work through a little example um, of something that I have edited for someone. This is real. This is a real CV. Um, this is the profile summary. Um, and... You can read it now. You can see it's really not badly written by any means. But the person wanted support in trimming down the text. So how would I approach this? How would we go about making this deliver what the person really wanted it to deliver, but with fewer words? And that is your critical question. What are you actually trying to say? What is the purpose of a profile summary? Does anyone know? Sorry? To get to the yeah, that's a really good answer. It's it's about showing your personality and showing who you are. A lot of your a lot of your CV is just fact. It's going. I worked here from this date to this date, or I got a degree from this place. The profile summary is one of the only places in the CV, apart from things like interests and hobbies, it's one of the very few places you can really show your personality and who you are. 
So you have to really make it work for you and really sell what it is that you're trying to do. So let's just go through it. And these are the things that I pulled out as being the really critical things that I thought this person should highlight. So I'm eager to learn any new skills as required. That's not going to be an easy one to pull out elsewhere in the CV. Let's keep that in. I strive to always implement the best solution as opposed to the easiest. This is rare. Not a lot of people do this. Definitely wanted to keep this in. This was this was awesome. Helping and encouraging others and colleagues around me as well as seeking advice. Great. Love that. Let's keep that in. Actively pursuing further knowledge on my own time. Again, really like this. I've coloured it the same colour as up above because, again, it's about learning. It's about that continuous kind of self-improvement. So let's colour code them in the same way. And then this last bit. Um, I've grown to massively enjoy the blue team side of security. Um, this is ultimate, This is where I gain my feelings of fulfilment and job satisfaction. This is what I really want to pull out in this profile summary because this is what is most important to the applicant. You don't want them to go into a job they hate because what drives them doesn't match up with the company. I really, really, really want that to come through. Other parts. This bit at the top, um, I just cut it. Um, this, a lot of this is just the kind of almost like CV fluff that people think that they have to include. But actually it's become so diluted now that if you see those words, you kind of just skim over them. You don't pay any attention to them. Um, it's not in this particular example. Um, but another phrase I really hate is attention to detail. And, and the reason I hate it is because it sets you up to fail. Um, if you put that on your CV, the first thing I'm going to be doing is looking for a single typo in that CV. And if I find one, your CV is gone because you do not have the thing that you told me you have. If you don't put it in your CV is wonderful in terms of grammar and spelling, I'm going to automatically ascribe attention to detail to you without you having to put it in yourself. I think it's one of the most overused things in CVs that I've ever seen. And then this part here as well. I've been working in the cybersecurity industry for over two years. That This is obvious from your employment history. Anyone can see the kind of current position that you have. So you strip that out. This is what you're left with. Um, just remove the colour coding. So then to work further through this, let's look at structure. So... The key thing here is what let's put what really drives you, which is who you are as a person. Let's put that up front. And then everything else that you do to achieve that should follow on from that. So that's that's the ultimate structure of what I'm now working with. And then you start doing the, the actual line edit. Um, you're going through and actually just changing the words themselves. A lot of this is quite some a lot of this is just my choice. I prefer during rather than throughout. That's a personal choice. Um Cybersecurity I'm putting in because I'd cut it with the previous iterations. Um, I have changed, grown to massively enjoy into discovered a real passion because grown to massively enjoy suggests that you absolutely hated it to start with. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something you just really don't, you, you want to avoid the negativity as much as possible. It's discovering the passion for something that you didn't know existed. Um, you want to talk about Instead of impacting operational efficiency, improve. Because again, impact can be the completely negative direction. You could just be absolutely wrecking things across the joint. And also things like the quality of the service that the company I work for provides to its clients. I changed that to we provide to clients because something that really came out of this person's CV was their desire to be part of a team. And showing like we provide to clients, we provide to our clients shows that you consider yourself part of that business. You're not thinking of yourself as this kind of side entity that just happens to be associated and that happens to be paying you. Um, the next part, I kind of did a general rewrite, to be honest, um, just to kind of condense all the things, uh, the things I spoke about, um, about the kind of uh, actively pursuing further knowledge and continuously learning new skills. I've just added that in, continuously learning new skills and technologies. So this is more of a kind of compression edit to just make it that bit more concise. Um, and then the helping and encouraging others and colleagues around me as well as seeking advice when needed. Now, this to me, again, it kind of comes across as CV fluff, but it is a really critical point in its own right. So for this part, I, I spoke to the person um, whose CV this was um, and I was like, 
okay, is this genuinely important to you? Is this something that really, really makes you happy? And what is it that you get from this? So um turns out, yeah, was critical to them. It was something that actually was one of the main parts of their of their job enjoyment. So we just kind of fleshed that out to just bring that um just bring that out a little bit more. Um so then that's what we ended up with. Which still looks a little long, but that's it against the original. All the critical points are there. It's just condensed and it's so much easier to read. And also just saved a lot of room on the page because they were really, the, the whole kind of two page rule that we were trying to stick to, they were really, really hampered by this section. And it just made it a lot easier. Um, I should also say that this is just how I did it. Different people will approach things differently and that is absolutely fine. There is no right or wrong way to do these things. Um, it's just about trying to bring out the person within. Um, and to be honest, even now, I noticed things I would change. Um, like, I only spotted this when I was putting the slides together, where I've said deep there, and then deeply enjoy there. Don't let that repetition annoys me. But it's it's too late now. It's fine. Um, but yeah, nothing nothing is ever going to be absolutely perfect, and you can all do it differently. Um, but just think about what it is that what is the message that you really want to put across. Um, which brings me to my kind of tips section um, <laughs> you can blame Scott for that one um, figure out what it is that you want to say um, and there was a really really lovely example of this recently so at B-Sides Leeds um, Silverfish did his scavenger hunt and one of the items on it was deliver a lightning talk um, on a talk that had happened that day so there was one particular team that um, they figured out a slight cheat around it. And so James Moore was speaking. And James Moore gave, they convinced James Moore to give a lightning talk of his own talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> which was, it was absolutely wonderful. They actually recorded it on my phone. I have it. It was wonderful. Um, it's just my little souvenir from B-Size Leeds. Um, so, but James put this up um, on LinkedIn, just kind of talking about how useful he himself found that. Um, because it really brought out what are the core things of the message that I'm actually trying to present. And just that, yeah, there's just this little bit at the bottom. If you have talked behind you, give it a try and see if you can bring them down to just a few minutes. That will just really, really help you identify what that kind of core message is that you're trying to get across. Um, not just for yourself, but also just for who's reading it. So going back to... to Holly Grace Williams slide, what is most important for the person reading a pen test report to know. This is the kind of technique that can help you identify that. Maintain a style guide. This is a little tip from my editing days. Um, style guides are mm -hmm. critical, I think. I think everyone should have them. I have um, I have ones for, for like business things. Um, I, I made one for ID Cyber. Um, because that's the kind of thing I do. Um, but I also maintain a personal one in my own head. Um, this is because, so you have standards for coding, but you also really need standards for text. This is how you show people that you yourself have attention to detail. Um, it's, it shows that you have a certain standard that you have set yourself and you will maintain that and you will pay attention to it. Um, so it doesn't have to be like massive. This is just, this is just an extract of like the kind of first half of the one I put together. Um, but it's little things like, is cybersecurity one word or two? So, <coughs> and this actually differs from my personal style, guys. My personal preference is one word. But for work pur purposes, we use two because it works better for the SEO. That's literally it. But we have this guide. If you're writing these words, you do it in this way. You do it in the way I said. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it, it just helps keep you um, on the right page. Knowing your own tendencies is a big one. Um, this is what kind of really comes out if you um, if you do a lot of writing or a lot of talking. Actually pay attention to the words that you use and the grammar that you use. Um, so I, I had a vague idea of words that I overuse on Twitter. So I did a little kind of 
analysis of the last 100 tweets that I put out. And I was absolutely right, because I thought I overused really positive words. So we've got great, and we've got incredible, and we've got amazing, and we've got awesome. And yeah, I'm just very, very positive on Twitter, apparently. Um, <laughs> yeah, I thought someone would point out. That was one single tweet as well, which is really impressive. I think there are five uh, instances of donuts from a single tweet. Um, also, books. Um, which is quite <laughs> so yeah that's literally that's just the last hundred tweets like if I'd done bigger it would have been a much more kind of accurate picture but it was just the kind of thing to reinforce myself yes these are the words that I reuse and maybe if I wanted to be a little better with my own writing on Twitter maybe I would pay attention to that and try and avoid them a little bit more I'm also very aware of my own kind of grammatical tendencies I love an M dash. Um, that's the kind of parenthetic mark. Um, I use them all the time. Quite often, I will finish a sentence, look back, and realize I put four in there, and I'll then have to rewrite um, to just strip them out again. They are, I mean, I absolutely love them. Um, but I, I have to work really hard to avoid overusing them. That's a real problem that I have. Opening with a prepositional phrase. Um, <laughs> I do this. <laughs> I do this an awful lot. Um, if I'm writing reports or kind of like blog posts and things like that, I, I have a real, real tendency to open with a prepositional phrase. I don't know why. I don't tend to do it in spoken words, but I do it all the time in written. So whenever I've written something, I have to go back through it and just go, did I overdo this? Um, also, over emphatic punctuation marks. I've kind of gotten to the stage in my punctuation lifestyle where I've decided that one exclamation mark is not enough and actually comes across as sarcastic. So I have to do two to just be sure, no, no, this is genuine, genuine excitement. Um, again, something that I do a lot on Twitter, not really anywhere else. Um, but I kind of just watch out for that. Oxford commas. I love an Oxford comma. Um, I am firmly pro-Oxford comma, and I will have many debates with you if you disagree with that. Um, but it is entirely optional. Um, that is very much a personal choice. Um, but it means I've come into... I've had to rewrite quite a lot of the work I've been doing for Bell and Cat, because they say they are, they are anti-Oxford comma. And I naturally write Oxford commas everywhere, so that I then have to go through and strip them out. So it's for me, it's just being aware... I have this tendency. I do them completely automatically. I know that I'm going to have to go back through and remove them. Um, and then just pointless word games that I play for my own amusement. Um, recent, actually, recent example of this. Um, my colleague uh, kind of rolled his eyes at me for this. We recently did um, an OSINT CTF, or to avoid acronyms and initialisms, a capture the flag event, like a treasure hunt based around open source intelligence. Um, but when we got the the answers, um, I then wrote a series of haikus to describe the actual answer um, to the CTF. So that's the kind of pointless word game that, to be fair, it's actually quite fun. Um, and I would actually recommend it because it gives you a really good command of your own language. Um, but aside from that, so this is a really... Like, you'll have seen this plastered all over the internet. I think I've seen it probably 50, 60 times. And that's not including everyone that sends it to me on pretty much a monthly basis. Um, but I think this is really, really important. Um, this is where knowing your own tendencies really comes into play. If you know your own tendencies, you can avoid doing it too often and instead put them in where it really matters. Um, it's Yeah, don't just write words. Write music. But from a tech point of view, it is not just about writing in a more interesting way. If you know your own tendencies, if you need to, for example, have uh, sock accounts for, say, OSINT investigations and things like that, look at the language patterns you use and make sure you're not replicating that in your socks. That is it's just kind of a very kind of basic kind of protective measure um, to stop that kind of wrecking your investigative work. Um, so knowing your tendencies is really, really important. Minor thing, but I thought worth bringing it up. Um, be careful with dates. Um, a lot of the time, if you're writing things like blog posts, news articles, things like that, and you'll be you you'll see everywhere like 
last week, last month, um, you'll see that dotted in, and that really dates what you're writing. And some, and often that's deliberate. Um, news articles you want it to actually be datable, um, because you're like last week, and then it's out, it's out of date like a week later anyway. You know, kind of okay, this this actually helps date it. Um, but other times you will want to avoid that. Um, it's one of the reasons. So I wrote a kind of blog post for work, um, about a course that I'd been on. Um, and I deliberately, even though the post was put out in February, I deliberately started with in February rather than this month because I knew that we were going to be reusing that blog post uh, many times. It's been reposted two or three times already. Um, and I knew that if I started with last week, it was not going to age well. Structuring your arguments. Um, this is something that is going to be really basic to a lot of you, but just in case you, you don't know. Every argument, some people some people will say every paragraph, but I think it's better to think about it in terms of arguments. It's just your classic, tell them what you're going to say, then tell them that, and then tell them what you've told them. Um, if nothing else, even if you end up stripping out some of that at the end, it helps you really formulate your thinking and get the critical ideas across. Um, just really, really basic measure. Um, and my top Google searches... Um, these are awesome. I use define colon word all the time. It just really brings the definition to the top. Um, please use it. It's, it's genuinely it's my most used Google search term. Um, and the other one is, um, I'm only mentioning this because I'd spoken to someone who didn't actually know um, a really easy way to get other words for the same thing. Synonym word. Like Google will bring back, they'll just bring you a list of all the different ways you can say what it is you're trying to say. It's really useful. Um <laughs> Don't overuse it because you're going to find that what you've written becomes really massively like verbose and it's it's not you at all. But it's good to just kind of point you in the right direction for different ways that you might say things. And uh, you are not always going to get it perfect. Um, so I've already pointed out um, where I'm now seeing my mistake with deep and deeply on that kind of profile summary in the CV. Um, and actually, the, one of the three typos in my in my talk title was not deliberate. I only no so it, it wasn't meant to be why words matters. Um, I only noticed that when they sent out the schedule, and so I was like, okay, that's fine. Um, it's just the hazard of typing on my phone. Um, everyone's going to make mistakes, and that's fine. Um, the key thing to really know is that you can always improve, but the way to improve is to actually pay attention to what you're currently doing. Um, there are always going to be better ways to do things, um, but it genuinely is something worth working at because you all know a lot of stuff and you want to tell that to the right people um, and you deserve to be able to tell people about that in the most effective way. And that's what words will do for you. And that's me. Thank you. <laughs>